from the UK, broadcasting around the world. Around the world. You're listening to the Mic Drop Club, hosted by Douglas Hammond Message received. Message received. You do not need to know what you need. What you need. Just engage with the podcast feed. Just engage with the podcast feed. Providing weekly insights into cool stuff we've read, saw, did, or heard about what made us say, wow, eureka, damn, nothing is off limits. If it motivates and inspires you to reach your goals, then it shall be discussed. Featuring guest interviews from high performers and people of influence and weekly awards for the best mic drop moment. This podcast is guaranteed to leave you pumped up for the week ahead. Don't just live life, make life boom. Doing is Doug Simon DJ for another episode of the Mic Drop Club. And today I thought I might as well reflect on my career as I transitioned from a clinician into a digital transformational leader. And this is just to share what it takes to make that transition. Because a lot of people have been asking me, how did you do it? Why did you do it? So this is part of a bigger picture in terms of how I got to doing the great work that I do. You know, I find it, it's, a, it's an honor, it's a privilege to be in this position that I find myself in, offering value, um, being able to inform the way care has been delivered across different um, clinical areas from community to inpatient. It's a real honor knowing that your interventions, your suggestions help influence the way care has been delivered. And I don't take that lightly. So today, as I'm going live across LinkedIn, Let's have a discussion on what it takes to make that, that, that actual journey, the actual, the actual journey from, you know, taking orders on a ward situation to actually saying to yourself, I can do this. There's something about knowing that you have value to offer that is so, so important. And I cannot stress this, stress this enough. You might think that I'm speaking very metaphorically speaking or very biblically, biblically speaking, but I'm not. I'm basically saying you've got to have a calling because it's not easy breaking out of the mold that you find yourself in. You can get typecast, stereotype very quickly in any clinical role that you're in, from radiography to frontline nursing to support work to doctors. You get stereotyped that. Why are you talking about a different subject matter? So first and foremost, I will say you've got to be able to answer and respond to your calling. And you know what happens when you have a calling because it's like an itch that keeps on, that you can't scratch. It's always there. It's the ever-present thing that you have to do it. And if you choose not to answer your calling, that's fine. There are many people who don't answer the calling, but the danger is this. If you don't answer to your calling, you'll be faced with regret later on in your life. And you don't want that. Regret is the worst feeling you can possibly have. When you know that you could add value, you know you could have changed the process, but you chose not to. You chose the path of cowardice. So you have to be courage. You've got to be courageous. You have to have the ability to self-reflect and be aware of how you are perceived by others. For example, in trans- transformation, you're, you're basically changing the status quo. And in many clinical environments, the, the status quo has been like that for a long time. Just imagine when all the clinical records were categorized on paper. Just remember how long that process was going on for, paper-based processes. And just switching the narrative, switching the, the, the view to recording stuff digitally, clinical notation digitally, took a lot of effort. For many, this was a step too far. For many clinicians, they got out of the game. Some doctors stopped practicing because as far as they're concerned, they were being de-skilled overnight because they didn't have the digital um, literacy to make that leap. So when we are doing this, 
you have to understand how we are perceived by other people. If we know that we need to improve our ability to communicate, join Toastmasters, for example. Practice on the way that you tell stories. Practice trying to persuade people. Ask for feedback. How are you being perceived? As a clinician, we have what's called the Johari window with the various dimensions that you ask people, do you know this about me? What do you think that I'm saying that's hidden or that I think I'm hiding from you? Just to build that sense of self-awareness is so, so important because to master digital transformation and reach the zenith, as it were, of being considered maybe a genius in your field, somebody that can really influence and transcend their, their role they're in, you have to be self-aware all the time. Your awareness level has to be up. Your sensitivity to embracing your information and understanding what you can do with the information has to be so high. Because when we're working in digital technology, those nuances, those little tweaks in language mean completely different things clinically. And this has been borne out, out, out of the words such as interoperability, how interoperable systems are, where people can misconstrue these meanings. It's because they're not one clearly defined. People don't have a common understanding of it. They can misinterpret it. So if you're working in a digital project, knowing that, you've got to be able to then communicate what that literally, literally means clinically. To your colleagues. So it's being able to be hyper aware, a hypersensitivity to transformation is what is required. So don't be scared to um, go out and seek um, confirmation in terms of how you perceive yourself, you know, and challenge the, the feedback that you get. If people are saying you may be coming across too aggressive, you need to work on that. And there's not, no harm in working on that. You just need to be able to do it. Um, the second one I'll say is, and I see it all the time in change management, uh, change management stroke transformation, is this ability to work with uncertainty. When fellow clinicians ask me, Douglas, how did you make that make the leap? How did you manage to juggle the two? They're looking for basically a guarantee. They're looking for uh, an assurance that if they too do it, they're guaranteed to succeed. In other words, they're risk adverse, right? They want a guarantee that if they do what I did or, and what other colleagues of mine have done, they too will be successful. And I can't answer that question. Every path is different for every individual. All I can say is you have to first bet on yourself. You have to give yourself the permission to be in the game irrespective of what your job title says. Like I said in the beginning, you've got to be answering your calling. You've got to first give yourself that permission to say, look, I can add value. I've got a unique set of experiences, past and present, that will enable me to solve a problem within my community, amongst my peers. I'm, I'm that person. I'm that individual. So you've got to first bet on yourself. Even, even when you do that, there's no guarantee. And this is where the magic really happens. Because when you feel that you're, you put all your chips on yourself, you go all in. And it will reflect on the way you conduct yourself. It will reflect on the books that you read, the, um, the groups of people that you hang around, around with, how you network. It has a bearing on all those things. So first and foremost, you cannot be certain in this thing. You have to gamble. But I'd rather gamble myself, this is my philosophy, than gamble on somebody else. I'd rather put a bet on myself and go all in. And then through that, you know, for those people who gamble on themselves, their, reward, their rewards are so much greater when you succeed. And take people along on that journey with you as well, okay, to try and mitigate that. Gro growth, right, often requires stepping into the unknown. It's how you learn to walk. Embrace the uncertainty that comes with the change. Understand it, own it, write it down, 
how you're feeling, write it down. Because you cannot support a digital change program if you cannot embrace that change yourself. Write down how you're feeling and talk to that feeling because that will be the language you'll be talking to your peers, your colleagues, the, the people that are going to be on the receiving, end, the receiving end of that transformation. Write it down and work with that. Learn how to parry that. Learn how to mitigate those changes because that is where the transformation is taking place. The third point I want to say is basically being able to align your passion with purpose. Aligning your passion with purpose. Passion, motivation are never guaranteed. They are fleeting. And recognizing that passion and motivation are fleeting, you've got to be able to sustain it. You've got to know, know how to nurture your passion by collating and um, giving yourself opportunities to have sustenance in around your passion and banking it. Because when the passion runs low, your motivation to move forward also dimin diminishes. So first of all, respecting passion and motivation are not always going to be there. You've got to be able to create an environment for your passion. I create like me a studio in my basement so that I know if I need to create something, some content, I can do that at a drop of a dime. I can just go downstairs. I have an environment to do my work because I'm saying to myself, when passion comes, I have a place for, for, for content creation. I've got a place to then exhibit that passion. I can articulate it. I can actualize that passion and I can move it in the direction of my purpose. So I believe I have a purpose. I'm into transformation people, products, and services. That's what I do. So that understanding of my purpose that I can say to you on one line means I can say no to certain environments and yes to um, other environments. I can say no to certain opportunities and yes to other opportunities. It steers me. It provides me with my true north. So this is what you need to do. You've got to really understand that passion alone is not enough. It must be aligned to that greater purpose. If you don't know your greater purpose, meditate on it. Pray on it. Go on walks for inspiration to find it. And if you don't have it, wait for it to come. Because eventually you should know your purpose. I don't believe anyone's born straight away and they have purpose in the head. No. Or in, or in the heart. Purpose will come through your experiences, what you've seen, and understanding what greats are you. What change do you want? There's so many naysayers and so many people talking negative that are too scared to put their head above the, the parapet to bring about the change that they want themselves. And that is where brave people, people who are courageous, step up. It's cowardice to criticize people that, for example, put out content, it might not be the best content, to put out a football team but don't win a match. It's easy to critique and criticize, but to actually do it, that's another level. And once you have committed your passion to your purpose, you meet other great, great people on that journey, linking their passion with their purpose and moving progressively forward in their lives. And this is where it's about moving progressively forward in your life. You are so much more. MikeDropClub.com Make life boom. Um, the third one, the fourth, shall I say, is thinking about your continuous learning. And now I'll do that. Let me just change the, this, this screen here because I think for some reason it's blurring. Yeah. Is think about your learning as being a lifelong endeavor. As a mental health nurse since 2003, we understand that, and our registration dictates to us that our profession requires us to embrace lifelong learning, right? So we must also do that for our own passions. 
we must also embrace lifelong learning for our own passion. It's continuous. And the best way I learn is through joyful in endeavors. I like to play to learn. I can't learn when I'm angry. I have to be in a very playful mindset. And that way I can engage more, more of my senses to the learning process. And so I would advise you all to think about that. Where can you learn? Go out and seek knowledge yourself. People that are self-taught are completely different that have gone through the academic route. And I would say their inner genius shines more because they've said, they've said, I like this. I want to pursue this. And they go deeper and their breadth and depth can, can sometimes surpass those people that have the narrow dogma of an institution, of a course. When you decide to choose something to learn yourself and master it, seek mastery in it, you're in a far stronger position than somebody that just solely went for the educational route to, to dictate what they understand about a subject. So you have to be thinking a lot about learning and then adapting what you know. So where I add if, um, leverage is I've got engineering, mechatronic engineering qualifications. I've got nursing. If I smash those two together like this, like this, I can create something completely unique that's never been seen before. Or if it has been seen before, not when I add my authenticity to it because everyone's individual. So the way I interpret it, information is going to be completely different from somebody else, you see? So... This is what I'm talking about. You've got to be able to take on knowledge and then adapt it for whatever situation you're in. You've got to stay curious. Those people who are naturally curious, natural contrar con contrarian, that always like to look at the other dimension, the other side of the coin, as it were, offering solutions. These are the people that typically work best within digital transformation because you've got to be, up, be prepared to upset the status quo all the time. You're not looking at a piece of technology and saying, oh, this is, a, this is a great piece of tech and we can't improve it. As it stands now with AI, every company, from the biggest to the smallest, from Apple to IBM to um, any Android, everything's up for grabs. And all these big tech companies, they know that. They know that. It's the brilliant minds of those people who are curious to ask the questions, who can embrace the spirit of lifelong learning, new knowledge, and be able to evolve with it and, and join the dots. These are the meta skills you've got to be able to have, be able to know how you learn. I know how I learn. The environment has to be correct. I've got to be able to play. That's how I learn. Other people have a different technique. Knowing how you learn, they'll say in the 21st century, it's not the illiterate people who can't read or write. <laughs> That's going to be the biggest issue or biggest challenge. It's those people who can't learn, relearn, adapt and evolve their knowledge. These are the ones that are going to suffer. Not, not your numeracy skills, your reading skills. Yes, they're important. But the skill to be able to know how to learn, how to unlearn what you've learned, how to adapt that knowledge, how to evolve that knowledge, how to translate that knowledge. These are the areas that you need to give yourself prime focus. As we move on to the fifth one, which is, I love this one. This is about creating a network and networking is so, so key. And it goes down to self-awareness. You know, as somebody that can be introverted, so I can be extroverted, I'm like, I'm like 50-50 on it. Even though I'm ENFP in my my Briggs um, on, on personality scale, I, I can be introverted very easily. And I do find sometimes coming out of my shell difficult, which is why I like this type of environment, because I, I know the equipment, I can talk to the equipment, I can look to the iris of the actual lens and do my thing. I kind of like, like that. Sometimes being um, front-facing can be nerve-wracking, but I still do it anyway. That's why you see me on stage. I still do it anyway. I still push through. So you've got to surround yourself by individuals who support and challenge you. 
that will push you onto that stage, that will help raise your hand like this. Answer the question because they know you got the answer. They will put you in environments where you grow that might be terrifying. They'll help you. And if you look at your network and your network is not growing, remember you're the sum total, sum total of the people who you surround yourself with in terms of your success, in terms of your monetary value. So if you find yourself broke, you not don't have aspiration, you're not moving anywhere in your career, I guarantee it, look at your network. Because I cannot be spending a lot of time with people that don't have aspiration, that don't have motivation. I like to gravitate around people that have that about them. And if you do the same thing, you find your career goes up as well. So as you're moving from a clinician or a clinical role into transformation, you have to build a network of like-minded people that are, are centered around personal growth and achieving their fullest potential. Achieving their fullest potential. And this is why I'm also making a case for Gareth Southgate to be given a knighted. You know? Uh, because he helped that team reach its fullest potential in that moment. They reached the semifinals. And this is what you need to be able to do when you're working around digital transformation. You want that change to enable people to fulfill their biggest, boldest goals, their fullest potential. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to do at all times. Not all the, doesn't mean that every road, every transformational project you're going to lead in, lean into, it's going to be successful. But I would just say the way we frame success also needs to be looked at because if we have a, a change program that reveals that people like X instead of Y, that was success because transformation um, is an iterative process. You, you change after iteration, after inter iteration, after iteration. That's what it's about. I talked about courage as well, but I just want to raise it as a separate thing in its own right and talk about boldness. You've got to dare, dare to dream. Dare yourself. Come on. Whisper to yourself, you can do it. You know, once you take a courageous step forward in any direction, the way you feel inside changes. That little cat in you, that little mouse in you becomes mighty mouse, becomes or transforms from cringer to battle cat. That's what happens when you decide consciously to take a bold step forward. You grow and your silhouette, your shadow grows along with you. Your network expands. Your influence grows. So take a bold step, okay? Even when you, even when you don't feel like doing it, or even when you feel too shy, still do it anyway, okay? And the last one, the very last one I want to talk about is the different styles of leadership and the different transformational leaders out there, the different change management techniques. You need to be leading with your authenticity. Your most authentic self needs to be in play at all times. The second you are being that which you are not, you will struggle to take people on that journey. This is why I remain a clinician. I've never relented on my registration. So when I talk to clinician to clinician, I'm being authentic, I'm being my true self. I know my values, I know my principles, I know my beliefs. I do not work in, on projects that um, go against any of these principles that I have. It guides me in terms of my actions. It, it creates an environment for me to operate in where I can put my whole self into. The second you start pretending or being somebody else, being non-authentic, not non-authentic, you will struggle in areas where the person you're modeling yourself around is not there. You'll be completely lost. This is why I champion coaching a bit more than mentoring. 
Because I found from my own personal experience, when I started this journey, my mentors, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to think like them. I was, I was like, what would they do in a situation like this? Then I found when I couldn't um, think about or create an environment where I could think and replay some of those conversations, I was lost. I have to accept my quirks. In fact, what I'll say to you is this. You see your perceived quirks, your perceived weaknesses, your, your blemishes. These are features, product features. These are features in your authenticity that no one else can replicate. No one else can replicate. If you've got a lazy eye, if you've got awkward gait, if anything, you can make it, if you've got a stutter, these are features of your skill set that will enable you to be authentic, to give you the evidence that you need that, that there's no one else like you. We've got too much gray. Sprinkle some color. Add some flavor. Put some seasoning. Whichever way you want to cut what I'm saying. But all I, we're advocating is your quirks. Lean into them. Lean into them. It will help you. So any place on earth and you being yourself, you always be at home. Okay? Stay true to those values. Stay true to those values, principles, and beliefs, and you shall succeed. So once again, I like to say peace. You guys stay blessed. Take care of yourself and each other. Doug Sam DJ from Mike Drop Club. Boom. I'm out. Do you struggle to achieve your goals or to find your purpose in life? Why waste your time dreaming when you could be fulfilling your biggest boldest brightest goals tune in to the mic drop club and listen to guest speakers and people of influence as they reveal their secret techniques to help you to get to your dreams and goals and turn them into reality tune in to the mic drop club where the secrets behind achieving extraordinary results are shared weekly with your host douglas amanda shea